want to ask that you would turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Whoever's phone went off this morning, um, I want you to not be, like listen to the voice of the enemy, okay? Um, you know, sometimes things go wrong and things like that. And this is the best weddings I've ever, you know, ever attended. There was always something. So uh, this family is this family is committed to one another, to working things out. You know, and I, I sometimes I want to. I thought that was like pretty amazing that sometimes. Things happen during whatever, uh, during a service, or and and Jesus even saw some interruptions as things were going on. You know, children interrupted him in the middle of some of the things that were going on. And Jesus always had mercy and compassion. He always had love. And sometimes uh, I just wanted to, you know, there was a couple of times where I missed it, and I felt like, man, I'm beating myself up. And I want to make sure that we as a family we're not doing those things. Because stuff's going to happen somewhere along the way. So. Uh, as we go into the scriptures this morning, this is one of my greatest concerns, one of my greatest uh, thoughts. I want to always emulate, uh, not just for a good representation, but just for me, just for the Lord. I want to be who God wants me to be. Uh, and this is, this is, the title of this message is Living and Walking in the Spirit. I want to. I want to emulate the spirit. I want. I know you do too, as believers. We don't want to, and, and God accepts us just the way that we are. But we don't want the same old Rob. You don't want to be the same old person that you were. You want to appropriate. Well, God loves us in our hearts. You know, there's there was things in here that I'll share with, with you. Uh, there was a hurt that I had. had a, I've been disappointed in, in relationships at a young age, and I thought, man, you know what? That's just not for me. I don't want to do anything with relationships. Uh, and, and I kind of built up a wall in my heart. Uh, I wanted to, The wall was first designed to protect me. But you know what happened is those walls became a prison, and it kept me from having relationships with people. And it wasn't what the Spirit wanted from me. The Holy Spirit wanted me to follow Him, to follow His leading and His guiding. I had to let down some walls. Some of you may have to let down some walls this morning. Uh, you, you, you may need to be led by the Spirit to let down some walls to trust some people because today I have wonderful relationships where I, I, I can uh, trust people and people can trust me. You know, but that doesn't happen by not letting down those walls. So some of us might have a hurt or a habit we want to overcome. Now some of us have habits we want to just get, we want to get past the past. I know I wanted to get past the past. You know, we have an old nature that we have to deal with. How do we deal with that old nature? How do we do these things? How can we do something that willpower, because it was, if it was up to will, if it was willpower, it would have been done a long time ago with some of you. Some of you have great willpower. Well, it's going to come, uh, and this supernatural walk that we are called to is going to come by living and walking in the Spirit. It sounds simple, but sometimes you ask people, how do you walk in the Spirit? A lot of people don't know. So I want to go over that this morning. How do we walk in the Spirit? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 18 to 25, God wants to get us past the hurt. He wants to get us past an idiosyncrasy that maybe we've accepted. He wants to get us past the insecurities. He wants to get us past something into something else. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 18, and that's the first verse. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's more than just like the law of the Torah, but that's like limitations. You transcend limitations, maybe even self-imposed limitations when you walk in the Spirit. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. These are the works of the flesh. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Now when we look into the law, sometimes people, I, I know I did, we can be self-deceived. I looked, I was like, oh, I'm doing pretty good. But then I looked at what the works of the flesh are, I still got some of this stuff. If you're honest, and you, uh, unless you know, you've already been raptured, you got some of this stuff. You're working on. You got some of the old nature that you're working in. You're, you're working on and dealing with. Real people can be honest about that before the Lord. They say, hey, you know what? I'm still working on some of this stuff. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, 
Envy, big in the church. Envy. Not liking somebody because they have something. Murders. Murder is not uh, one, uh, killing somebody. Murder uh, defined by Jesus is looking at your brother or your sister and not liking them. Man, that's what Jesus says. Murder is easy. He raised the bar in the, uh, the New Testament when he gave us grace. He told us that uh, adultery is not just not just actually the physical act, but he said adultery is to look upon a woman or for a woman to look upon a man, or in these days, for a woman to look upon a woman or a man to look upon a man and lust after them in their heart. That's committing adultery. So he raised the bar. He didn't lower the bar for those people that are into the grace theology. We're called to walk at a higher level of living. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do that by living and walking in the spirit, not in our willpower. God wants us to do things that our willpower is not going to be able to accomplish. He want, The call that He has for your life is going to be past your ability. It's going to be past your ability. And it says that there are others, revelries and drunkenness and murders and the like, in which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sometimes people condemn themselves because they fell short. I want to let you know that as a sheep, when we come into the kingdom, just because you fall in the mud or because you, uh, you know, make a mistake, that doesn't make you a pig. You're a sheep who just fell down and got a little bit dirty. You got to get, get back up and get clean and continue on. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. There's no limitations. There's no rules. And this is what I found, is when I walk in the Spirit, God makes things happen that I can never make happen. He does things inside of me that I could never do. He delivers me from things and He heals me of things that I could never, I could never heal myself. See, God is the great physician. And when we walk in the Spirit, we make the decision. He comes in and He lives His life out in us. This is what a, a true born-again believer is. It's an ambassador, a person who is an ambassador for Christ that the Holy Spirit has lived so long in them that the character and personality of God starts to overtake their personality. You ever talk to a person that has a lot of anger or wrath? They think it's their anger and their wrath. You ever deal with a person who has lust? Or, uh, and they say, well, because of my lust. They're owning that thing. Why? Because another spirit has lived inside of them for so long that they think that's part of them. Our responsibility is to be a container. We are a temple. We are to sanctify and set ourselves apart for the, the living God to live out in us so long that His personality becomes our personality. Is that, does everybody get that? So it says self-control and against such there is no law. And who are Christ having crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires? If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Here, here's, a, here's something that we all need to know. The fight is finished. Jesus won it. He appropriated victory for us. He took up His cross so that you could take up your cross. We're called to take up our cross how often? Daily. daily. We're called to take up our cross daily, deny ourselves so that the Spirit can live inside of us. Now these are the things that are going to be required for those people that want to allow the Holy Spirit to live through them. And that's every born again believer. You know, that's every person that wants to get past that past. That's every person that wants to get past the hurt, be healed of a hurt. That's every person that wants an idiosyncrasy or a habit. They want to get, they want that thing to change inside of them. You want to get past an addiction. You want to get past a destructive cycle. You want, you want change in your life. Yeah. You know, and, and this is one. Of, I want to challenge you in this. Maybe you have a, a, a certain level of success in your Christian walk. Well, don't settle. Because your comparison ought never to be like another man or a woman. That's not mine. There's a lot of people I love and admire and respect. And even as, as a pastor, uh, people sometimes, I want to be like, no, don't be like me. Be like Jesus. Amen. Don't set your bar so low that you would try to be like another man or woman. 
Set your sights to be like your Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the plumb line. He's the standard. Maybe other people are a, a few steps ahead and you can take an example from them. But your true example is Jesus Christ. The one who died. The one who took the penalty upon himself so that you could be free. And not only so we could be free, but so that we could set other people free. Sometimes people are like, well, you know what? I, I, I just want it for myself. And I think that's really <coughs> selfish. Yeah, you'll get to heaven, but you'll miss the whole plan and the purpose of why God set you free. It's so that we would be the continuation of the incarnation. Jesus Christ living inside of you. See, he deposited himself inside of us so that we can yield to the Spirit. That's number one. You can write that down. This is how we walk in the Spirit. We yield to the Spirit. Some things, I'm not going to get complicated for you because the gospel is not complicated. Sometimes people want to know like the deep things of God. I'm like, man, you know what? We don't even, sometimes people don't even know the basic things of God. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 talks about the foundations of the faith. A lot of people even struggle with the foundations of the faith. We want to know what is walking in the Spirit. The first one is yielding to the Spirit. It said in the beginning of that verse, it says, if we walk in the Spirit. And then in verse 25, it talks about the same thing. Is that we want to yield to the Spirit. Why do we want to yield to the Spirit? Because God's a gentleman. Did you know that? God will never force Himself upon you. It's a decision. He comes by invitation only. This is me. I want, I want you to know. I don't go places where I'm not invited. If I'm not honored there, then I'm probably not going to go there. I'm not saying that they have to, you know, if the person doesn't want me there, then I'm not going to go. Well, God's pretty much the same way because if he's not wanted there or if he's not being paid attention to, he's going to stop talking the same way that you are, you know. There's some people you talk to and it's like, okay, I'm going to talk to you. But then there's people that listen and you want to keep talking to them and sharing with them. But then there's other people it's like, yeah, it's going in one year and not the other year. You know, they're not in their head, but you know they checked out a long time ago. <laughs> So what do you do with those people? You know, you kind of start talking to them. Well, that's the way the Holy Spirit is. It's like, well, if he's not going to listen, I'm going to leave him to his own devices. And this is what I found in my, in my cycle until I learned that I'm going to definitely walk in the Spirit. I went through this. This is what I noticed in my walk and my immaturity is that uh, I would get into a place where I was, in a, I was just broken. Have you ever just been broken before the Lord? It's like something happens, a calamity or a crisis or situation. You're just broken before the Lord. Has anybody ever been broken or is it just being? You know. So in that place of brokenness, a person asked me a question this week, a friend. And he said, you know, I just feel so close to the Lord when I'm broken. And I was like, I can totally relate. And this is what would happen is that I would get broken in my younger days in, with the Lord and I would get broken. I'd feel so close to the Lord. And then he would start to work things out inside of my life and my circumstances. He would start to make me whole. And I'm saying this to you be, to be transparent is that then I would start taking my life back. But like I got this. And you know what would happen? I'd get broken again. And this is what I learned. Maturity is not needing a trial to yield to the Spirit. That, that's gold for somebody. Maturity is not needing a trial or a, a hallelujah moment because you know what? I don't want to always depend on that situation or circumstance to break me so that I yield to the Lord. That's designed to get my attention not to keep my attention. So he got my attention, and then, now what I want to do is I want to always yield to the Spirit because I don't want to start to ignore the, the voice of the Holy Spirit so that I start to go in my own direction. Some people are just, really honestly, just too prideful and self-willed. They, they want to go, they, they only want enough of God to avoid the circumstance or the trial. Or the difficulty. You don't really want to change their life, life. And that's where I believe a lot of the church is today. They just want enough of Jesus to avoid the circumstances they don't really want. They don't really want to take up their cross. And I want to say this to you. Is that, that God is only going to move in your life as much as you're willing to allow him to move. He's not going to touch the areas you don't give him. 
But you, we're going to find ourselves in a cycle if we don't, because he's jealous for you. He wants all of you. So again, we want to yield to the Spirit. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. And I'm not giving this to you. I'm sharing this with you. These, these are lessons that I learned along the way. If we live in the Spirit, we will, we will also walk in the Spirit. Romans 8, 14 says this. Are you a son? Are you a daughter of the, of the Most High God? By raising hands. Are you a son? Of the, are you a daughter of the King? Okay. Well, this is what you got to do then. It says there in black and white. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Some people, their flesh leads them. Their feelings and their emotions lead them. None of this is meant to lead us. What's meant to lead us is the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of God will only lead the son and the daughter if we allow them. If we allow him to lead us. Submission. People have that wrong. They think that submission is beating somebody down until they give up. That's not what biblical submission is. Biblical submission is knowing and recognizing somebody else has your best interests at heart, so much so that you're willing to follow them because they would probably give their life for you, or in Jesus' case, he did give his life for you. Amen. There's nothing forced in true submission. It, true su biblical submission is always about a willingness to follow. Sometimes people misunderstand that in, in marriages, and I have to help people with that. Let's go to the second one. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it tells us the second one. We're to be, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. When somebody's drunk, let's be real, because everybody's been around the drunk person pretty much in here. Has anybody not been around the drunk person in here on live stream? Okay. All right, so we can all. <laughs> when somebody's drunk, this is what, they're not on, did you ever notice they're not in control any longer? It's not really their personality anymore. Alcohol is considered a spirit. They call it spirits. Mm. So uh, another personality takes over. Uh, uh, they're under the influence. Did you ever hear that saying? Under the influence? Well, something else is control, in, in control. When a believer is drunk in the spirit, what they are is somebody else is in control. That's a beautiful place to be. I'm no longer in control. The Spirit's in control. That's what that scripture is saying. It's saying, be under the influence of the Spirit. That's where we need to be. We need to be under the influence of the Spirit because that's where Jesus was when in Luke chapter 4 verse 1, and this is what I had to learn in my life, is that God's a lot smarter than I am. And we might say that intellectually, but in my heart now I know that. No matter where he leads and guides, because you know what, where he led Jesus, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was led into the wilderness. Well, there's a purpose for your wilderness, because God may lead you sometimes into places that you don't want to go. Your flesh probably won't want to go. And you'll have a decision. Do I follow my flesh to get the same results that I've always gotten? Or do I move on to new results that God wants to lead me to? Because when Jesus was led into the wilderness, it says that he came out with something else. He came out with power. See, there's a, there's a plan and a purpose for God. Uh, when we're under the influence, we're going to follow his leading and we're going to follow his guiding. Daniel was led into the lion's den. He was led into the lion's den. And, you know, some, I, I believe that this is for you and for I, that we're going to be led into some places where in the natural would look bad. But that's where God's going to show up. He showed up for Daniel. He brought him into a lion's den. I mean, everybody could have looked at that in the natural and just be like, I'm not going into the lion's den. I'm going to do everything that I can. I'm going to sell out my faith. But he didn't. No, they didn't. They, they put him into the lion's den and God shut the mouths of the lions. That's what your God is famous for. Your God is famous for delivering his people in difficult circumstances. Right now, when we look around, and I know things are, there's a lot of corruption in the world. There always has been. 20 years ago, I sat in a college class and people were talking about the Holocaust. And they were saying, how could people do such horrible things to one another? And I said to the people in the class, have you turned on the news lately? 
Because people are doing, they're doing the same horrible stuff that they've always been doing. What, 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 what's surrounding us right now and there's an immorality and all of these different things. And I looked into the Bible and guess what? I saw in the Bible that the children of God were never really the rulers. We've always been under oppression. Why? Because you and I have not been sent to the, this is not our promised land. We are, we are Navy SEALs. We are spiritual special forces that have been dropped behind enemy lines to set as many captives as we possibly can free. This is not my life. This is not my final destination. I'm only here long enough to set as many people as I possibly can free. You are only here long enough to set as many deceived people as you possibly can free. Yes. Yes. 120 years, that's not a lot of time. 100 years, 80 years, whatever it is, that's a short period of time. Let's not lose focus because we weren't sent here to be comfortable. We weren't sent here to... We were sent into behind enemy lines to set the captives free. Some of you know Satan's strategy so well because you were probably some of Satan's best soldiers. You know his tactics. You know his strategies. Now, the worst thing in warfare is when a person who was once on this side goes to the other side. Now, you know all of the enemy's strategies. Some of you know how he's operating and working way before he starts to even work. Our call right now in this season is to yield to the Spirit, to be under the influence of this Holy Spirit, not some other spirit. Some people are filled with pride and filled with anger and filled with lust. And fi What we're called to be is filled with the Spirit and under the control of the Spirit. You want to fulfill your call and your destiny? you got to do that. The third one is this. And I know this isn't for everybody. Hey, not everybody's going to be a spiritual gladiator. Some people are just going to, this is, this is the truth. Everybody has the potential to do it. Not everybody's going to take it. You know, as a trainer or a coach in a gym, you know, you can look at somebody and see, man, they work hard at it. I've gone to the gym and watched people, and there's like a miraculous transformation almost. Like, man, I'm like, this person was this way, and then now a few months later, they're completely different. Where a person with the same potential doesn't reach that. Why? Because they don't apply the spiritual disciplines. I believe every spiritual believer within five years can be spiritually mature, on fire, advancing the kingdom of God. But that means that they're going to have to take time. That means they're going to have to die to self. That means they're going to have to give up some things so that they can gain some things. The disciples took three and a half years with Jesus to become the, the men that God called them to be. Remember where they were? They were like, I mean, those guys were mess-ups. They were mess-ups. And then three and a half years later... Peter is delivering fire on the, the birthday of the church, on the day of Pentecost, that 3,000 people get saved. This was a guy who denied Jesus, by the way. And there was such a transformation that took place in him. And that's what God's will is for you and for I. He's looking to raise up spiritual gladiators. He's looking for people that will say no to the world and yes to God. They're, they're, he's looking for people that will say earth's trinkets, trinkets can't Grasp my attention. I'm after heaven's reward. The third one is this, is praying in the spirit. I love watching around the sanctuary and seeing people praying in the spirit. Why? What are they doing? They're building themselves up. In Jude chapter 20, it says this, if we want to walk in the spirit, we've got to yield to the spirit. We have to be under the influence of the spirit. We have to pray in the spirit. Too much flesh I mean, we can accomplish things in the flesh, but that's going to get burned up in the fire. I don't want what I'm doing to be burned up in the fire. I want it to last through the fire. So I, I, we want to pray in the Spirit. We want to pray in the Spirit, building ourselves up in our most holy faith. This is what it says in Jude chapter 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. What, what it says in, the, in one of the versions is uh, edify. And what edify means is building up a massive, magnificent structure. You know, this is what I was before, is that I wasn't praying in the spirit. I was like one of those little shacks, those little old shacks, all rusted, and like a little wind would come and I'd get knocked over. Where I have the choice now is I pray in the spirit and I'm building myself up. 
You're building yourself up. Some of you are a fortress. You can't, impenetrable to the enemy. Others, you're like shacks. And you wonder why when the wind and the waves come that we're back into our feelings and our emotions. No, I don't want to be taken about by what the circumstances. I want to stand and stand some more. I want my feet to be upon the solid rock. I want whatever goes on in the world around me that I am unshakable, immovable. That's what it says in the word that I can be, that the wind and the waves can stand. We can stand against those things. So we can become that massive, magnificent structure. The way that we'll do it is by praying in the Spirit. Some people, and, this, and, I, and I love them, but they're so undisciplined. And that's what we, this is what I spend my life doing. Trying to help people to develop holy habits, divine disciplines, and righteous routines. This, this is, and I'm okay with it. I'm okay with being there to support people and help them. But eventually, at some point, people are going to need to be able to have their own faith and stand strong for themselves. I would fight everybody's fight for them, but I can't, and neither can you. Every person, we gotta lead them back to Jesus. They need to be praying in the Spirit. They need to develop their own relationship with God. They need to yield to the Spirit. They need to be under the influence of the Spirit, and then they need to be praying in the Spirit. And this is the fourth one. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you. In John chapter six, verse 63, it tells us real clearly. So when somebody asks you if you're, well, you know, uh, about walking in the Spirit. Well, how do I walk in the Spirit? Now you can tell them. I yield to the Spirit. I don't do what my flesh tells me to do. And the more that you do that, the, the, the more that we'll grow. If we'll decrease the self, God will increase in us. There are things today that used to be a, a struggle for me years ago that they're not even a struggle. I've moved on past those things. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you've moved on past those things. You're almost like this, saying you better get something new because that same old stuff ain't working no more. <laughs> how many of you want to see people, how many of you want to get passed on to new things where Satan doesn't use the same old, same old against you? Well, how many of you want to help other people to get past some of their, the, those, that's, that's where we are. We're, we're, we, as believers, that's our heart's desire is to see people. These, this is what it's going to require. We're going to, it's going to require that the word of Christ dwell richly in our hearts. It says in John chapter 6, verse 63, it said, it is, it is spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. When I was a young pastor, the Lord told me, and I used to love to work out and lift weights. I wake up with the pains in my shoulders because of that today. What the Lord told me is that when I was, and I used to love to lift weights, I'd go and I, he said, there's nothing wrong with lifting weights, to, he said to me. He says, but if you're going to be a great pastor, you've got to give it up. And I was like, what? <laughs> there's nothing sinful about that. He says, no, you put too much attention to it. Bodily exercise profits a little, but the spiritual exercise, godliness is of great gain. So I was like, oh, wow, you know what? Where are we investing our, the, our greatest efforts? Are we investing our greatest efforts into making money and advancing our profession? Or are we advancing our greatest efforts and putting, sowing and investing our greatest efforts into the kingdom and developing ourselves as men and women of God? I know people with marriages that are falling apart, that they're investing more time and energy into making more money. And I'm like, man, this is such a trap. You're going to end up in divorce court. You're going to give the lawyer about $40,000. And <laughs> you guys are going to be battling all this stuff. And I'm not, I'm not saying, any, I'm not judging anybody because we're all subject to deception. What I want to get past is this. Is I want to get past the same old strategies of the devil. I want to get past those things. I want to help other people to get past them. And we want to gently, lovingly guide them and direct them because uh, we need to walk in the Spirit so that we can <coughs> defeat those things that once defeated us. It says in John chapter 6, verse 63, It is the Spirit who gives life. Nothing else gives life. Money doesn't give life. I know a lot of miserable rich people. I know a lot of people that have wonderful cars. And I know a lot of popular people that just are miserable. None of those things. There's one thing that gives joy, and it's God. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. That word life is not bios. Bios is the natural kind of life. That's Zoe, the God kind of life. God wants you to have the God kind of life. His life is a life that's bigger 
than your dreams and your hopes. He has a better plan for your life. This is one of the things that you hear me say often. And God has a better plan for your life than you do. I learned that I was thinking small time. And God was thinking much bigger. He wants to biggie size your dream. Forget about biggie size in your meal at the fast food place. He wants to biggie size the vision that you have because yours is small potatoes compared to his. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 it says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, this is, not as a, this, is not, this is just an objective question. Where are you investing your time? You know that the average American is going to spend, I think it's close to 30-something years watching television or on some media device. They say that people spend almost eight hours on some type of media device. You know how much they're gonna spend how much time they're gonna spend in church overall in their lifetime? Four months. Where are we where is Satan stealing our life? Now imagine if we shifted that and we put more time and more energy and more attention into the things that are gonna profit us the most. And we took our attention off of the things that are stealing our time and our energy. And I, think, I believe one of the biggest challenges for us today is the media devices. They say they're, they're destroying the family structure. This is quality time. I'm not going to get onto that, though. But this is quality time. Everybody's on a media device in the living room. You go out and you eat, and everybody's on a media device. And they're all looking, and they're thinking that they're spending quality time. It's almost like we've got to get rid of those things. If you're live streaming, you know... Hey, praise God. <laughs> Making an investment. I have to think about it too. Because I'm like, this thing can, we can become slaves to these things. We have to intentionally, on purpose, make time to yield to the Spirit. Make sure that we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Ghost to edify ourselves and then filling ourselves with the Word richly. These are the four things to living and walking in the Spirit. Yield. Pray. Let the word of Christ dwell richly inside of us. This morning I want to pray for you, brothers and sisters, because I, I know that I know things are gonna get I don't wonder, I know they're gonna get worse. I know it. I want to be ready. I want to make sure that my faith does not just fail me. I don't want it to fail me, I don't want it to fail you. Because that, that's what I live with. I live with, you know what? How is my faith going to benefit, forget about fail, benefit the people that are around me? That's where I want to be. That's where you want to be. That your faith benefits you and the people that are around you. We're going to need the Spirit where we're going, where He's taking us. What, what I can tell you is this, is that you are living in the best of times. Yeah, I think gross darkness is going to come around, but you know what? We don't need a lot of light. We just need a little light. We just need to be filled with the Spirit so that the enemy can steal, kill, and destroy, and that we can advance His kingdom here on the face of the earth. I tell you that the Lord has chosen the right ones for the job. He's given you everything that you need, but now we need to decide to work those things that He has given to us, to exercise ourselves unto godliness, to be trained in righteousness. Father, I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and my sisters. Lord, we're here to be disciples. Lord, we want to get past some of the things, Lord, that are our past, that have held us down. Lord, I, we want to be healed of things that have held us back. Lord, we want to get into a new season, into a new place. We don't want to fall for the same old, same old, Lord. We want to, Lord, be renewed in the Spirit. We want to yield to you, Lord. We want to pray in the Spirit. We want to be fully mature and prepared, fit and ready for battle, Lord. So that when Satan's devices are formed against us, Lord, that we won't fall, but we would stand. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you are calling my brothers and my sisters to be a benefit and a blessing to those people that are around them. They can't fight the, the, their fight for those people that they love, but they can certainly encourage them to take up their weapons, to not be asleep, to be alert, to be prepared, 
to develop the holy habits, the divine disciplines and the righteous routines that will bring them good success in their own spiritual walk. We thank you, Lord, that you're raising up a ministry and people, Lord, that are, are going to stand and stand some more during the difficulties. There will be a light. And Father, that uh, you would raise up this ministry to be a refuge to people that are hurting and suffering. Lord, that we consider that a privilege and an honor that you would entrust to us what matters most to you, lives and souls. We give you honor, we give you praise, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you all.